Um, so yes, it's, uh, it's um, my great pleasure to welcome everyone to this exciting Slavonic event on anarchism in Russia. I'm Daniel Green and I teach um, 19th century Russian literature here. And it is a great shame um, that we can't meet in person, but it is wonderful to see so many people um, here virtually. And we're particularly lucky to have our speakers um, live from St. Petersburg and from Michigan. Um, so we'll hear two presentations today of about 25 to 30 minutes, and then we're gonna open up to a Q&A. Um, and if everyone would mind going on mute now, uh, that, would be, uh, that would be wonderful for the presentations. And then during the Q&A, um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can either raise your hand or write that you have a question in the chat. Uh, and for those of you who don't know to raise your hands, you need to open the uh, participants window and it's using the button next to the chat. And when I see that um, you have a question, um, I'll call on you and um, ask you to unmute. Um, and just so you know, and I've put this um, in the chat too, this session is being recorded. Um, and uh, uh, we expect then if you are participating, if you're asking a question that, that you're giving consent for that to be part of the recording. Um, if that's not the case, then um, please, uh, please write to me um, in the chat. Um, and one final thing, um, I think that I can see, um, uh, yes, I think pretty much people are using um, their real names, um, a couple who aren't, if you wouldn't mind changing it. So I've, I've enabled it so that you can edit, um, edit your name. Uh, that would be great and make it easier for us to, to do the Q&A and have a dialogue there. So um, without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Maria Rachmaninova is a professor of philosophy at the St. Petersburg University of the Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, she's co-founder of the Journal of Anarchist Studies, Akteria Tochke Info, and has published broadly on gender, post-colonialism and cinema. Her most recent book, Vlast i Tjela, Power and the Body, came out earlier this year. Today, she'll be talking about the history of anarchism, its position as an alternative to Marxism, which was itself an alternative system to capitalism, and its relevance in today's post-Soviet world. Thank you, Maria. Uh, good evening, dear colleagues. I'm very pleased to make a presentation at this conference, and I uh, thank the organizers for such an invitation. Uh, Russian researchers get uh, uh, rarely the opportunity to share topics that are important to them with the international community. So that's why I want to apologize in advance for my mistakes and pronunciation. So I rarely speak English. Uh, so my name is Maria. I'm an anarchist researcher and PhD, PhD in uh, social philosophy. And my report uh, is about Russian anarchism yesterday, today and tomorrow. So I'll show you a presentation. Um, I guess it's visible, yes? Okay. So <clears throat> for the whole modern world, Russia is a no note of permanent tension. The events of the last decades show that from the environmental, political, military, economic, and other points of view, Russia inherits the unpredictability and opacity of the USSR, multiplying them by everything that now distinguishes it from the former state. For a world already experiencing the severe consequences of the modern modernity crisis, the close and intense presence of such a dangerous and incomprehensible neighbor is a separate challenge. Therefore, to understand Oh, sorry. Therefore, to understand the phenomenon of Russia means to take a step towards common security and maybe even towards common well-being on the planet, especially considering the part of its territory and resources which officially belongs to Russia. But how to do it? Today, the Russian reality is still permitted by the inertia of the Soviet world, not only in terms of global and local processes, but also in terms of ruling figures, deeply Soviet and their thinking, values, and political strategies. In this sense, to talk about Russian still means to talk about the Soviet world, adding a long episode of its half-life behind the bracket. In fact, a non-Soviet era has not yet begun and won't for a while. 
Therefore, it seems to be most correct to use the word post-Soviet. However, despite Russia's intensive reception of technologies and trends in the Western world, critical reflection on Soviet reality from a post-Soviet perspective has not yet taken place. Films about the Gulag number less than 10. Events like the suppression of the Novocherkask are obscured from 99% of school children and criticism of repression is drowned out by the noise of Putin's pompous restoration of Stalinism. The Soviet lives, breathes, speaks to us and speaks with our voices, still unable to see itself from outside. Ironically, many progressive forces around the world continue to cherish by inertia the old hope of the bipolar world. The imperfect but certainly more just world of the Red Tsar as the only possible alternative to predatory neoliberalism. For this reason, many progressives supported Putin's intervention, um, Putin's intervention uh, in uh, Ukraine and approved Russia's violation of all international military legal agreements. That's why the unraveling of this hope and the Soviet phenomenon in general is so important not only to get the historical justice, but also for the painful issues of modernity and our presence in it here and now. In order to get closer to the understanding of the Soviet, it's necessary having listened to its own defense of itself, as well as its criticism from the right, to turn to the history of a, of a project that ideologically formed an imaginary unity with the Soviet and then turned into its main rival and then into its enemy. This enemy was crushed. Uh, how and why this happened is one of the main mysteries of the Soviet world and one of the keys to the hopes that the Western world continues to uncritically nurture for Putin's Russia. The name of this project is anarchism. One should reflect upon Russian anarchism, its potential, specifics and prospects at least from 1905, from the moment uh, the first free labor councils appeared and from the very first revolutionary strike. All this became the starting point for the truly visible revolutionary practice of anarchists in Russia. The movement developed rapidly, largely thanks to numerous Russian texts by immigrant theorists like, like uh, Bakunin and Kropotkin, for example, uh, despite the period of stagnation in which Russian society found itself after Stalipin's cruel suppression of the 1905 revolution. Before the October Revolution of 1917, the anarchist moods of the people gained unprecedented strength. In 1918, the anarchist movement began to flourish. Until that time, the populist rhetoric of the Bolsheviks hewed as close to anarchist as possible. The image of free councils even inspired the name of the new state, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The principle of councils is deeply anarchist and rooted in the tradition of the so-called free cities of medieval Europe, see Kropotkin um, mutual aid as a factor of evolution. However, for the Bolsheviks, this principle is confined the populistic rhetoric. Sensing the people's demand, they decide to use the slogans of anarchism for political self-representation and win the maximum trust of the masses, but just in the cities. They then throw away this support in favor of a new hierarchy. Despite their frequent flirtation with anarchist rhetoric, for a long time, the Bolsheviks hindered their participation in mainstream discourse by monopolizing the press. According to Sevalot Volin, anarchism was strangled in the bud. The repression of anarchists, first the Bolsheviks' main allies and then their first and primary competitors, begins immediately. Once government is in their hands, anarchist means folk. Rhetoric is no longer needed. However, Lenin made a serious mistake. 
waiting for the expansion of the revolution to other countries, hoping that the Russian revolution will fan the flames of a worldwide fire, he didn't take into account that the Bolshevik revolution was not really authentic. Its fire was extinguished. The peoples of Europe were waiting, losing faith and growing disappointed. For example, Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman with her text, My Disillusion in Russia. Meanwhile, Soviet leaders accused everyone else of failure, not realizing that the real cause of the death of the revolution was that it went the wrong way. Noise, advertising and bluffing didn't help. The authoritarianism of the new hierarchies quickly turned into a Stalinist absolutism. Trotsky's policy was already pregnant with the Stalinist dictatorship. The true people's a revolution never happened. The party's leadership suppressed it, first destroying the people's self-government, then self-organizing at the factories in Petrograd and other cities, then drowning the free Ukraine and Kronstadt in blood, and then curtailing most of its progressive programs related to sexual education, experimental communes, women's emancipation, alternative pedagogy, and so on. All this led to the prolonged peak of the Soviet project, getting heavier and heavier every year. That ended at the turn of the 20th century. From the very beginning of the Soviet Union, the leftist progressive forces of the whole world were breathlessly watching its fate. It became the first incarnate pillar of hope for socialism in a world where capitalism had already discredited itself in all spheres, from economy to ecology. Even anarchists in America and Europe were ready to accept the Soviet world despite its Marxist foundation. Nevertheless, it was better than the old monarchies. Nobody wanted to believe those who came back from the USSR disappointed. Neither the first nor the subsequent alarm signals were heard from there. After all, to hear them was to lose hope for extra capitalist scenarios at once. Even the frightening news about Soviet concentration camps began to reach post-war France. In the left-wing camp, there were disputes about whether these news should be made public or quashed, so as not to take away from the workers of Europe the bright image of the Soviet utopia. Otherwise, socialism will have no chance at all. Thus, the refusal to see Soviet reality was the last straw to the world held onto in the face of capitalism's increasing power. However, tunnel vision didn't help. The collapse of the USSR led to the final discredit of the left utopias. As the whites were ousted from Ukraine and Siberia from 1918 to 1921, the references to anarchism in the official Soviet narrative became markedly more hostile and less frequent and then disappeared altogether even from dictionaries, reference books, and encyclopedias. For 70 years in the Soviet state's rhetoric, they will be artificially connected with criminal aesthetics, political insolvency, and theoretical absurdity. All the colossal achievements of anarchism, its victories and discoveries, will be artificially erased and forgotten. This will be repeated in case of the Spanish anarchist revolution. For all these decades, Few will remember that it was the anarchist project that inspired the people all over the world so much when they believed in Bolsheviks and their free councils, the pure anarchist concept, not the vanguard party, so much that even now most people around the world do not see much difference between anarchism and Marxism, including Soviet Marxism. The fear of losing faith in the possibility of alternatives to capitalism has played a fatal role for the world, preventing it from seeing the deepest substantive rift between Soviet rhetoric and practice. This is in distinction linked to the fact that anarchism as a truly popular and horizontal project and Marxism-Leninism as a vertical vanguardist project merged into a single monolithic and disappeared together from political radar after the collapse of the socialist bloc gaining a common fatal brand of unattainable utopia. However, such mixing is incorrect and counterproductive. Counterproductive, sorry. Having served as bait and then having been crushed and slandered, 
anarchism has not discredited itself either before the revolution of 1917 or after, and therefore cannot be discarded for the same reasons as Marxism-Leninism. And if the progressive forces all over the world pin their most passionate hopes for alternatives to capitalism on the Soviet project, it was only because they were deceived by its rhetoric, not knowing about its original alternatives. Otherwise, they would have been able to put aside their fear and call concentration camps what they are, rather than temporary spaces with guaranteed jobs, as they did in Europe, and allow uh, the workers to, of Europe to be disappointed not in all alternatives to capitalism, but specifically in Marxism-Leninism. This would preserve hope for alternatism to capitalism by bypassing uh, questionable deals with concise and looking the truth in the eye. The only way to do this is, first of all, to restore the anarchist tradition, which is much more suitable for the role of a guiding star for all those who turn to the red world. Let one uh, the pseudo red world of Putin, which demonstrates quite monarchical tendencies and imperial ambitions not only rhetorically, but also methodologically and without shameful reservations about um, concentration camps and night arrests. This is what historians of anarchism in Russian speaking space are doing today. And they already have something to enrich Western social and political thought. Secondly, it's necessary to make a post-Soviet anarchist critic of the Soviet and its inertia is the only critic that has not yet been voiced audible from the left and at the same time, from the perspective of contemporary reality. So it's another one photo. Um, sorry. But also available, <clears throat> uh, but also available evidence from, <clears throat> uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, while maintaining maximum sensitivity to the problems of power in general, the anarchist critic can work as a modern Western decolonial reflection and <clears throat> thus provide not only epistemological relevance of contemporary reality, but also valuable evidence from within a system that has a huge and multifaceted impact on many regions of the globe. The connection between the anarchist and the colonial projects is direct here. Firstly, the decolonial tendency historically comes out of the anarchist optics. See Bakunin's critic, uh, criticism of colonialism. And in this sense, it's anarchist in itself. Secondly, the anarchist perspective is the only one from which the colonial research is generally possible. Both Marxism and liberalism are colonial projects, as world history has shown. In addition, from the perspective of anarchist studies, it is the post-Soviet link that is one of the few missing links in international anarchist reflection. Without this important element, the corpus of anarchist studies cannot become complete. If it's true that anarchism as a project to some extent is the last hope of mankind, as more and more thinkers consider, without this link, it will certainly not work in this capacity. What's being done about this in post-Soviet space? The RAS project are emerging from territorial defense in zones of Russian military aggression to academic reflection. For example, in Russia and Ukraine, a powerful historical community has emerged to restore anarchist discourse erased and hidden in the USSR. Their researchers include Pyotr Ryabov, Alexander Shubin, Dmitry Rublev, Irina Gordieva, Vadim Damier, Yaroslav Leontiev, and many others. Also, there are journals on anarchist studies. We organized one such journal with colleagues from different countries uh, of the post-Soviet space, setting ourselves the following tasks. So with the page. Uh, for first, to gradually overcome the iron curtain that remains between Russia and Western world due to the language barrier. For this, we translate foreign texts of the 20th, uh, 21st centuries into Russian and Ukrainian languages from English, German, Spanish, and other languages. Uh, we translate better than speak. <laughs> Secondly, to collect in a single corpus texts on anarchist studies published separately in little known scientific journals in different cities and regions. 
We hope this will make the anarchist discourse more visible. Thirdly, we write our own texts, those of us who have academic degree, and unite with authors of this direction, inviting them to cooperation. At the moment, we are working on the application of the latest foreign developments in the field of energy studies for reflection on the Soviet and post-Soviet phenomenon, and more broadly on the acratic, that is powerless uh, view of social political reality. So personally, I am working on an interdisciplinary uh, alignment of philosophical methodology, anarchist optics and post-Soviet reality. My new book is connected with the application of the methodology of modern and not only foreign energy studies to the unjustly forgotten project of analytical art in the USSR and the complex aesthetic system of Pavel Filonov. Prior to that, I conducted a similar study of the cinema of the film director and Soviet political prisoner Sergei Parajanov. I also researched the anarchist ontology of the body, the strategies of modern and not only anarchist aesthetics, the acratic analysis of the phenomena and processes of the Soviet project and projects that are alternative to it, and the epistemology that has developed in the post-Soviet space. My candidate and doctoral um, dissertations were devoted to this, and also gender issues. I also work on understanding the lines of demarcation between philosophy and the epistemology of Marxism and anarchism, both from the historical perspective and from the philosophical perspective. For example, where is the border between Marxism, Marxist and anarchist phenomenology, anthropology, epistemology, ethics, aesthetics, and so on. The anarchist project is still not very popular in Russia, where the imperial inertia of the USSR persists, turning into the imperial trends of Putin's Russia. But gradually dissertations, candidate and doctoral dissertations start to appear. The topic is gradually attracting young people as far as I can judge as a university teacher. And I think the next generation of researchers will approach it with more enthusiasm. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria. That, that was very interesting and gives us lots um, of lines, I think, for um, potential discussion um, later in the Q&A. Um, our second speaker, uh, Anya Eisman, is an assistant professor and postdoctoral fellow at the Society of Fellows at the University of Michigan. She's currently working on a monograph entitled Anarchist Currents in Russian Culture from Tolstoy to Pussy Riot. She's published on trophy films, Russian new drama, and the politics of Soviet children's poems. Her talk today is um, on anarchist utopian texts from the 1910s and 1920s. Thanks, Anya. Thank you so much. And uh, Daniel, I will just point out in the chat, uh, uh, Olenta is uh, putting some helpful links to Maria's work and some more information about Maria's um, recent books and uh well thank you so much for inviting us here i'm totally thrilled to uh to uh talk to everyone and excited about the q a and i will start from a, a point in time already mentioned by maria and this is this crucial period between 1905 and 1917 very quickly and then go to talk about my topic which is these as I called my essay, uh, second rate anarchist utopias and their extraordinary authors. Okay, so uh, uh, so I'll, I'll start. Anarchists who in the 1905 revolution probably numbered around 10,000 in Russia alone, by 1917 had established uh, institutions, newspapers and journals, not to mention various clubs and uh, innumerable societies and things like that. Um, uh, they had their ideas had enormous circulation that rivaled uh, prav Pravda and made some party luminaries nervous. We have records of Lunacharsky and Gorky lamenting how you know the Bolshevik events are emptying out because everyone is going to the anarchist talks. Um, it didn't help that in these rallies and lectures and articles, anarchists were openly discussing another anarchist revolution to hasten the demise of party rule um, 
uh, established in, October, in the October Revolution uh, and the foundation of a society without central government. Um, so the party initiated a campaign li liquidating anarchist cultural and political organizations in 1918. So this is where my story begins. With their access to audiences severely restricted and their position in the new regime increasingly fragile, anarchists turned to literature. And this isn't to say that they had avoided literature before. On the contrary, as Nina Guryanova shows in her studies of Anarchia Journal, and as Olga Burenina has argued and many others, anarchist revolutionaries, their ideas and actions were deeply influential to the Russian avant-garde. And this influence makes sense. Anarchist theory appealed to avant-garde artists as rebels against convention because it demanded a radically different world, a world without states and governments, and because it devoted so much space to theorizing the self and the individual via artistic creativity. We can recall Bakunin's winged phrase that the passion to destroy is a creative passion and understand his appeal to those who wanted to, quote, throw Pushkin, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, etc., off the steamship of modernity. Or we can consider that Peter Kropotkin's 1902 book, Mutual Aid, carried the message that forms of self-organization and mutual aid, that is to say forms of horizontal, what he deemed progressive institutions, actually evolved together with artistic creativity. So societies that give free reign to artists develop stronger um, and more uh, people-friendly, humane, uh, horizontal institutions, according to Kropotkin, in this sort of proto-ecological and anthropological work, uh, uh, this book from 1902. So, but although, and this I find very interesting, although political anarchists preached creativity and really cared about it and theorized it, they largely confined their own literary pursuits to political essays and propaganda poems. In the post-revolutionary era, though, in the that immediate aftermath of the revolution, different kinds of literature became more and more urgently necessary for that movement to keep its ideas alive when they couldn't be discussed in um, uh, markedly political uh, spaces and public polemics and political journals and so on. So this talk is drawn from the third chapter of my book, and uh, that chapter also discusses anarchist autobiographies and adventure stories. So it's a kind of like my genre chapter, all the places where anarchists uh, ended up uh, writing so that they could make sense of their experiences and also translate it in a different language um, than uh, you know the previous, um, in, than their kind of modus operandi of uh, polemical essay and, um, and, the po and the political poem. So utopia is just one of the genres that anarchists turn to, perhaps seeking to practice that creative freedom, which would, they hope, correspond to and sustain those free horizontal institutions that uh, Kropotkin had um, advocated. Now, why did they turn to utopias? And I'll make a few suggestions. As literary fictions, utopias could circulate in a different way than polemical essays, which had, after 1918, lost their publishing venues um, and were consistently under attack. And they could also participate in the literary process of their time, not confined to exclusively an anarchist readership. And then they finally, and most importantly, I think for us, help to think about the long view of history in which the latest destruction of the movement was but a brief episode. So I'm going to talk about three such utopian novels written by anarchists, roughly in order of most influential and protected anarchists to least. Um, and not incidentally, these utopias are also ordered from most closely set to its time, once set in 1930, to 2260, to a kind of mythic sort of parable nowhere time. And this actually makes sense. An anarchist secure in his social position would dare to offer how, uh, to offer a vision of how in a mere 10 years time from you know, the time of his writing, Russian society could achieve an anarchist transformation. On the other hand, the less socially protected anarchists were interested in narratives that entirely departed from reality since they needed to imagine a world that made not only their existence possible but also could actually manifest their principles. And what I find interesting is that these texts seen renewed interest from scholars as well as uh, anarchists um, so that they're also worth discussing for what they tell us uh, 
not only about the history of anarchism, but also about the spaces where Russian anarchism survives and persists today. So I will speak first, this is my first utopian author of utopias. This is, uh, I will speak first about Apollon Karelin. He's a fascinating and troubling figure and a thinker who brought thousands of people into the anarchist fold. And Karelin was a powerful man after the 1917 revolution, even as his comrades were being jailed or executed en masse, he managed to have an above ground political career. He was a celebrity anarchist communist, the chairperson in the Karpotkin Museum uh, Committee, and even a member of the Soviet government. And he firmly believed that by being involved in the government, he and other anarchists, dubbed Soviet anarchists for their support for the October Revolution, uh, could hasten that withering away of the state promised by Marx himself. Now, aside from his above ground career, Karelin also had an underground initiative setting up Freemason type organizations for the Order of the Russian Knights of Templar with rituals and legends that drew heavily on non canonical Christian traditions and on anarchist principles. And so an entire generation of mystical anarchists came of age in the schools and clubs and philanthropic initiatives established by the Russian Knights of Templar. Now, interestingly, we don't see any of this reflected in Karelin's dryly, in Karelin's dryly technical account of anarcho-communist utopia, since it was aimed at the mainstream readership. And it was part of this work to legitimize him even as he led this underground campaign. So Karelin writes this novel in 1921, it's called Russia in 1930. And the story has multiple frames. The narrator seeks out a quote, wonderful man who once a year on the night of Ivan, Ivana Kupala is able to see anything he wants to in, a lucid, in an absolutely lucid dream. And then the rest of the story is the report of this dreamer, uh, Sergei Varanov, as he reads a newspaper article from the future. So the entire story is just this newspaper article and this, it in itself is a report by two Englishmen, Mr. Winkle and Mr. Brown, who visit Russia after the people's uprising, quote unquote. And they're prepared to witness atrocities because that's what they've heard about in the West. But instead they're increasingly charmed by what they see. Prisons have been eradicated and public opinion and if needed occasional ostracism serve as cur social correctives. Um, Winkle and Brown visit a town trying to persuade its small proprietors to transition to anarchist communism. There's a free city they visit, they visit whose institutions are governed by unions and a village where associations of workers pool resources to conduct free and voluntary exchange with the free city. And then central to Karelian's imagination of this egalitarian society is the storehouse or sklad where provisions for common use are kept and, which, uh, and out of which being plentiful, um, uh, anyone may borrow anything or just take to use. So this is a rosy picture. In, in his conclusion to Russia in 1930, Karelin, or rather um, the article that Varanov is reading to Karelin's narrator as reported by these Englishmen, even offers a plan for how Russia will move from party rule as per 1921 realities uh, to anarchist self-governance by unions, federations and assemblies. Um, and he says the Russian people uh, simply vote anarchist communists into the council, the Soviets, and it, who then disband the said councils and dismiss themselves, um, uh, having established popular assemblies in their stead. So ultimately, this story frames this Englishman's travelogue with the trendy bid on lucid dreaming, uh, the stock plot element of magic on Ivana Kupala night, uh, lend the story its kind of air of familiarity and objectivity while cushioning a radical message that the Communist Party only has a few years left before the inevitable victory of anarchism. Now, Karelin didn't live to see to see that or really any, any much more development. He died a natural death in 1924, but then following his death, uh, his anarcho-mystical orders and circles would be liquidated, their uh, adherents tried and uh, trialed and imprisoned, and his legacy would be expunged from the historical record in Russia, though his text would continue to circulate in Russian-speaking anarchist communities, especially in New York and Detroit um, and elsewhere in the 50s into the 50s. And then the Karpotkin Museum and the committee that Karelin had once chaired that, that had given a sort of safe haven to so many anarchists 
uh, post-revolution, uh, would suffer a gradual hostile takeover and finally close in 1938, um, not before, but anyway, scattering the anarchists who had uh, survived uh, and remained associated with it uh, to the Gulag. Now, another anarchist utopia written just a year after Karin's in 1922 factors in that Soviet prison experience already. And it's written by Andrei Andreev and it's called Utopia in the Red House, Utopia v Krasnom Dome. And it expresses the hopes and dreams of anti-statists ensnared in the Soviet state construction project, so to speak. Now, Andreev had been a staunch advocate of direct attacks on the rich and the state and of ex expropriations or takeovers of uh, property. In the years he would spend in jailed or in penurious exile from the 1920s and until 1953 only deepened his faith in anarchist direct action um, rather than you know, teaching him that this uh, philosophy has been defeated, it's pointless, et cetera. Um, uh, he actually proselytized the two fellow prisoners wherever he went to dissidents and then to artists. Um, but interestingly, the utopia that he writes in 1922 is peaceful and even pacifist in its faith that scientific progress, and here is Karpotkin's influence again, inevitably tends toward anarchism. So in Andreev's story, two cellmates languishing in a Soviet prison decide that they want to see what the future hold, holds so that they may better prepare for it. And the younger cellmate, Ilya, falls into a lucid dream okay, that shows him the 21st century, when nations have merged into several large federations. And the Great Slavic Federation is the most progressive. Its capital city, Constantinople, is a temple of democratic knowledge. Wars and prisons have been eradicated, childcare is collectivized, uh, nudism is widely practiced, machines clean the air and do the hard work, and eugenic science helps control time and match people with their ideal partners. And taking a longer trip to 2260, Ilya sees that Chinese uh, has become the international language, mind reading is a common practice, uh, hermaphrodism, the next stage of Homo sapiens' development, is increasing among the population, and the microbe that causes death has been identified and will soon be eradicated. So at this point, the cellmates are incredibly encouraged um, and cheered by this uh, positive picture, but they're actually forced to stop their dream experiment. The elder cellmate has been ordered to prepare for the dreaded etap, the prison transport. And he tells Ilya that although they've proven that the future is much more important than the present, still the present matters from a subjective point of view. We cannot be, and he quotes Ivan Karamazov, manure for another's future. We have a duty to improve ourselves. And there the story ends. So though Andreev lived by his own imperative of constant self-improvement, honing his philosophy, openly criticizing the Stalin regime while uh, sort of recommitting to these um, anarchist principles, it did little to prevent his own life and work from becoming, I will just say, the fertilizer of others' ideas. Uh, for example, he appeared as a protagonist in Stefan Zlobin's unfinished novel, uh, The Morning of the Century, Utra Vieka, and he gave Zlobin's background, and he gave Zlobin, a good friend of his background and information on how to think about Stepan Razin for the novel that won him, um, Zlobin, the Stalin Prize. And then later in the 50s and 60s, we find Andreev and Zora Gandlieska establishing something of a hub for some is that in their apartment and helping smuggle major works of dissident literature in the West. So that writers, uh, former Gulag prisoners who would become these leading dissident figures are these frequent guests in their salon. And then also they're mixing with scholars who are interested in the history of anarchism and start that process that Maria was talking about of recovering anarchist history. And I will say, because I think Andreev's um, utopia is just so strange and so awkwardly cobbled together that what these authors lacked in talent, they made up for in their legendary attempts to correspond to their ideals, which I think is what impressed Zlobin and other people who then wrote about them and wrote about their history. Um, so through fighting and expropriations, through open criticism of the regime, through attempts to establish artistic institutions, and then through prison strikes, um, and escape uh, and escapes. Ultimately, Andreev and uh, these other uh, anarchists are, were counting on the effect of inspiration, 
Andreev hoped that the science of his time inspired so many of his colleagues into committing to anarchism and to biocosmism, unfortunately not part of this talk, but something I can talk about later, um, uh, would bring about an anarchist future where self-improvement is the only imperative. Interestingly, it included a sort of grassroots self-organized eugenics, but I, will, I can talk about that in the comments if anyone is interested. Um, so my last example of anarchist utopians, the Gordon brothers, Abba and Wolf, decided, decidedly rejected eugenics in theory as in fiction. Um, striving to be radically inclusive, they advocated for the universal solidarity of all oppressed people. In the pre-revolutionary era, they founded an anarchist free school for working class children. Abba Gordon worked in factories and led the workers' negotiations with the Communist Party. And like Karelin, actually, he briefly becomes a Soviet anarchist. Um, and then again, he led a massive, uh, then again, he also led a massive expropriation in 1918 to secure a building for the House of Anarchy, Dom Anarchy, and the popular journal Anarchia right in the center of Moscow. So the journal, uh, this journal would print Kazimir Malevich and Vladimir Mayakovsky, Alexander Rochenko, Varvara Stepanova, providing this fascinating meeting for a uh, meet platform for the meeting of intellectual anarchists, radicalized workers, and avant-garde artists. Now, the Gordon Brothers uh, utopia, this last utopia I'll speak about, is called Anarchia, uh, Strana Anarchia. Um, and it's a fairy tale science fiction that was serialized in the Anarchia Journal in 1919. And it's told as a parable, it's set in a kind of mythic time. There are five allegories of the oppressed self, the worker, uh, the woman, and the uh, oppressed. Mm, wait a minute, am I missing? Yeah. The oppressed nation and the youth. I got them, five. Uh, they find each other and decide to escape together. And then walking east, they're seeking the land of happiness. And indeed, they arrive in Anarchia land where there are five suns, five seas, and five mountains, equality, brotherhood, love, freedom, and creativity. Uh, and each of these incidentally represents a principle of pan-anarchism, the school of thought established by the Gordian brothers. These are communism, first of all, um, the liberation of the oppressed nation, secondly, which the Gordons fascinatingly call cosmism, uh, the liberation of women, the liberation of children and youth, and the liberation of the self. And that's this principle of creativity again. So Anarchia Land, as the five oppressed are told by their native guide, their informant, has conquered nature. It is a technological paradise governed by technicums, by vocational and intellectual societies. Um, in which human beings create, invent, and play while underground golden robots perform more menial tasks. Uh, through technological inventions, the dwellers of Anarchia land have conquered sleep, food, and death. And the five oppressed are constantly alarmed, shocked, just stunned by what they're seeing, and then enchanted um, following the sort of uh, shock and numbness and alienation. In the early 1920s, the Gordon brothers actually tried to live by these ideals. They established their own technicum, um, uh, called, uh, they, which they called uh, is a Britannia, um, uh, an inventarium, so to speak. And uh, their brand of anarchism uh, was, uh, even though they had had this sort of story biography, uh, was roundly rejected by the more influential anarchists, such as Karelin, who uh, called the mysticists and thought that it was too avant-gardist, their project, but reportedly and interestingly, it was very popular with working class audiences and with artists, of course. Um, for example, Leonid Heller uh, finds that Malevich borrows this idea of the technicum from the Gordon brothers, his Britannia concept. So though the two brothers drifted apart with Abba Gordon fleeing to the United States and Wolf to Israel, they retained their anarchist principles into the 30s and continued to preach uh, anarchism in English and Yiddish. More recently, they've attracted scholarly attention and have seen republication in books and journals aimed at popular audiences, which I basically attribute to their progressive views, but I'd be interested to think about other reasons for why. And so in all of these ways that I tried to show, anarchist utopias from the 1910s are still kind of eking out a little place for themselves in our collective memory. 
And I will say uh, some concluding remarks and thank you for bearing with me. So there is no doubt that unlike the brilliant work of their artist contemporaries, anarchist utopias are so earnest and so artless that they end up being kind of comical. In their struggle to fight against conventions, they negate actually the basic elements of literary craft. For example, uh, Evgeny Kuchinov points out that unlike traditional science fiction, anarchist utopias want to depart from science and nature entirely, seeing them as yet another form of authoritarianism. The comic effect is actually heightened by the conceptual shortcomings of these radical authors, men who robbed bourgeois establishments in order to find, finance the, their literary activities and yet failed to, for example, picture radical women. In his um, uh, Utopia, Karelian, this is Russia in 1930, complains that women are holding back the development of communitarian exchange. Women, he writes, wanted to window shop. And as forward looking as the Gordon brothers are, three of their five allegorical characters are evidently white men, while the interests of women in oppressed nation, quote unquote, are confined to two characters who have no desire between free love um, and anti-racism respectively. And of course, while contemporary anarchism is avowedly environmentalist, these early Russian anarchists were dismayingly off the mark in their discourse on nature. Um, the Gordon brothers exalt that technics has conquered nature, says one dweller in their utopia, there is no nature in Anarchia land. So given all of these failings and the added general obscurity of these artistic experiments and the political defeat of, of anarchism more generally, shall we not simply relegate these texts to the dustbin of history and treat their uh, persistent return in uh, recent discussions as a kind of empty academic exercise? I think no, <laughs> but bear with me. Uh, in his studies of science fiction, Frederick Jameson has pointed out that rather than expanding the imagination, utopian novels, more generally, not just anarchists, generally, manage to only outline the limits of what is imaginable and are unable to describe a truly new world because to picture it, they would have to depart entirely from the logic of this one. And this I find very is very true for anarchist utopias, but it does mean we need a new metric for analyzing them, that despite their artistic shortcomings, um, one that's not measured by their failure to capture institutional and political power while still um, accounting for their inspirational quality. I want to contend that the ideas, circulation, and reception of this literature show us that how the anarchist movement survived a crushing defeat that saw the exile, imprisonment, and execution of its members and the destruction of its institutions. Literature and defeat are in general fundamentally connected. Today it is by rereading everyone from Tolstoy to obscurities uh, like Andreev and the Gordon brothers, uh, in returning to uh, their works to print in their still legal presses that contemporary anarchists continue to develop their theories while coping with renewed censorship, unbridled far-right violence, and legal persecution. And these have intensified in the last few years. The show trial uh, called the Network Case is perhaps the loudest recent example, less public um, though are uh, the disruptions of cultural events by police, um, the journals closed, the activists surveilled, searched, and jailed uh, for artistic activity or for something like organizing a free market or vegan stand, um, and forced to leave the country. Um, contrary to official discourse, most anarchists uh, have come to reject the violent means to combat the state. I actually think that their turn to anarchist utopia writing in those early teens has something to do with processing a different um, kind of revolutionary practice. And what sustains the anarchist movement today, besides hyperlocal activist initiatives like fighting for building safety or saving a local park from construction, is it actually its own theory of social transformation, of change wrought by the force of, of firing ideas. By its mere survival, anarchism continues to wage that social transformation, albeit one person at a time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anya. Um... Uh, that was that was most uh, interesting, and it made me think in this in these um, sort of troubled times, how attracted we are again to utopias and to the possibilities that um, they present. 
Um, I'd like to open things up now uh, to questions from people. So as I said at the beginning, if you would um, like to ask something, if you could raise your hand and you can get to that um, through the participants um, button at the bottom or uh, write something in the chat uh, and then I'll call on people and if you could unmute yourself and ask the question. And um, it would be wonderful too, I'd like to um, invite those of you who feel comfortable um, to join us in the visual world as well, um, if you would like to, for this um, sort of Q&A uh, session at the end. So yes, uh, are, there any, um, are there any questions that uh, would anybody like to open? Hello, can you guys hear and see me? Yep. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David. I'm a first year MPhil at uh, Oxford, Russia, Eurasia Studies. Uh, thank you very much for the amazing presentation, both of you. And uh, my question is for Professor Rachmaninova. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of, um, I guess, modern initiatives, whether we using uh, sort of high tech telecommunications technologies, um, something that we see, you know, being used in Hong Kong with decentralization enabled by, you know, things like Telegram, something that we've seen right now in Belarus and, um, you know, and, and if you could talk a little bit about how sort of anarchist projects, anarchists in the former Soviet Union use these technologies, uh, that would be very nice. Thank you. And uh, may I just say, I am prepared to translate and Maria, if you want, I'm happy to do it. So it's, you know, mm -hmm. you can feel free to express your Thank ideas. you so much. I, I think uh, this question is clear for me. But um, <laughs> it can be uh, another way with other questions. So thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult to do something uh, beside telegram practices in post-Soviet space because of the repressions and the police uh, force and um, because of the control, the political control over the activists. So uh, we, uh, we have fear that uh, because of the pandemia, uh, even academic practices uh, can be now uh, in danger. So uh, we are not sure that uh, even our academical reports are allowed now. <laughs> and we, uh, uh, month by month, we have um, fewer and fewer space in the city. So five years ago, we could make uh, like, um, uh, make, um, uh, meeting in the in the street or somewhere else, but uh, a year ago we could do it uh, for our uh, for our own, uh, just one person in the street. And now uh, even this is uh, uh, not possible anymore. We can get in the, into the police place, and so um, there are no any practices. But there is some theory, and Anya said that there are uh, journals and uh, there are projects, uh, they, uh, they are uh, situated in the theoretical space, because it's the only allowed space now in Putin's Russia, which is getting more and more authoritarian uh, year by year. Uh, and this is the only way. But even Telegram is now under control. So even this only anarchist, true anarchist practice uh, is uh, problematic now. So we have nothing in practice, but we have something in theory, I would say so. I hope. Um, and an, another question, I, th I think probably also coming from Oxford, Alex Vukovic. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hey. Uh, formerly of Cambridge, Daniel, formerly of Cambridge. Indeed. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for, for two really um, excellent presentations. Um, I have a question about kind of anarchism in Russia today. Um, so how is anarchism theorized in Russia today? Is it mainly kind of a cultural position, a response to uh, kind of Russian imperialism. And second part of this question is, um, I think at the beginning, there was some mention of kind of anarchism as kind of separate from Marxism. Um, so I was just going to ask, I mean, how does sort of does anarchism as it's theorized in Russia today, does it think about production? Because I don't really necessarily see why there is an antinomy between Marxism and anarchism. I know that Bakunin and Marx were at odds during the first international, um, but libertarian 
sort of left uh, left wing communism and anarchism are totally compatible. Um, they both reject the vanguard, for example. So that's my question. Uh, thank you. Uh, is, is this question also for me uh, or for us both? <laughs> Whoever wants to answer. If Ivanya can start. <laughs> Oof. I wanted to uh, answer the first part of your question, uh, Alex. Um, uh, now, let me see if I got it right that you're asking about. Um, no, wait, you have to repeat it for me. I'm sorry. Sure, um, no problem. So just the first part of my question was just how is anarchism theorized in Russia today? I was wondering because it seemed to be more of a cultural position and I was wondering if it was a cultural position, if it was more kind of born out of anti-imperialism. And then my second part of the question was, um, what is this relationship to Marxism? Uh, actually, I'm not entirely prepared to answer either one of those, either one of those questions. I mean, the, um, there's a very lively discussion among anarchist historians and um, they, they deal mostly with just the recovery and return of texts and people and biographies and events and things like that. Um, and, you know, I don't know if that's theoretically interesting. It's certainly, um, it's certainly interesting that the, many of these people also cross into practice. So they are, uh, you know, quite important activists and um, they um, have a, their work is constantly threatened. Um, um, and maybe Maria could speak to the place of anarchism in philosophy because I'm actually not sure, um, not sure what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Um, so um, um, <clears throat> for first, um, uh, it's the question about uh, about the Ukrainian war. Uh, you you said it, uh, and you have got it very uh, very uh, well. So that's uh, the question about the colonial politics of Russia, because Marxism. Many Marxists in Russia don't see anything uh, bad in it. Don't don't see anything wrong in the Russian uh, uh, military aggression, because they have this colonial project uh, and they. Uh, they consider it to be um, like um, post-Soviet um, world and uh, the socialistic world that can um, unite everyone. But uh, it's not uh, the thing that many Ukrainians want and it's not the thing that many uh, libertarian and left Ukrainians want. So the only way for them is to separate from the Marxist project and not to call themselves like Soviet people. They don't consider themselves Soviet people. So firstly, it's the... Uh, question about um, colonialism, yes, and military aggression. Uh, uh, besides, it's, all, uh, it's also the question about um, cultural strategies, as you have mentioned, uh, it's really very important because uh, the strategies of art, the strategies of understanding art project of the former uh, epochs, uh, it's, um, very different in anarchism and Marxism. For example, in my book about Filonov, uh, which I'm prepar preparing now uh, for the publication, I try to show, to demonstrate how these different understandings of the strategies in Marxist art, like um, socialist realism art, and the other art projects, which were considered like bourgeois art, uh, how, how uh, it, um, uh, came in the connection with each other uh, in the Soviet history. And now it continues um, uh, some way because there are different projects, art projects that uh, have um, their tasks. And uh, the Marxist projects uh, usually put the uh, tasks which can be considered from the anarchist point of view, like uh, etatistic uh, or maybe colonial also. But uh, there are many, uh, there are many uh, difficult um, details. It's hard to, <laughs> to tell about it really uh, quickly. But um, what about the production? Uh, it's really very, um, very near. So anarchism and Marxism are very close to each other. 
but uh, the production is um, situated inside of the big cons uh, context. And everything is about this context, I guess. So uh, it's the main thing, the context and how it makes the production work, how it will be uh, connected with other uh, with other spheres, for example, the agrarian sphere, the uh, peasantry, and so on. Uh, I think about the context, it's the it's the main answer. I hope I have answered. <laughs> Sorry for mistakes. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Vasilis. Uh, hi, I'm a first year student at Cambridge. Um, obviously, thank you for the presentations. I want to ask either one of you uh, whether the Makhno peasant revolt had any tangible long term effects on the anarchist movement in Russia. Thank you. That's a big question. I, I think it's still an inspirational example for anarchists today. I think that uh, anarchists are very interested in studying it, um, not just not only in Russia, but uh, outside of it. So um, in, in uh, academic circles, but also in, um, you know, sort of anarchist uh, activist circles, I guess. Um, like you can encounter like countless groups of, you know, reading groups uh, devoted to studying Machno and the revolution and also the Spanish um, civil war of 19. In, of the 1930s, right? So these two are um, the sort of historical examples critically reflected on. I think one important project, and this is, I'm sorry again about the historical piece, is um, uh, re uh, um, restoring uh, the, um, uh, uh, not to say restoring, but um, establishing the historical fact that the Machno movement was not uh, an anti-Semitic um, pogromist movement. This, I think, is a very important part of the historical project um, because uh, uh, we have testimonies from people like Emma Goldman, um, you know, Volin, who uh, um, Maria mentioned, who is uh, um, the brother of Boris Eichenbaum. So, you know, a kind of close to the avant-garde, a major figure also of anarchists, many kinds of testimonies from like these kind of major cultural figures talking about the, um, um, the importance of the Machno movement in actually quelling um, anti-Semitic violence in uh, Ukraine. And this is something that has been very successfully, I think, erased from, uh, from history uh, in the in Russia uh, in the Soviet period, but in the US too, I think that the there has been a kind of concentrated effort to establish a connection between anarchism and anti-Semitism that doesn't bear out in historical fact, but there is not a lot of people to study um, to study that. So I, I, this is not so much, I think, what the sort of younger generation of scholars interested in this topic is doing, but it is actually what uh, they started doing in the, even in the 50s or so. Um, and, you know, maybe I'll name like Paul Average is this major, he is the person that you should really read on the uh, anarchist, Russian anarchist movement. He's a um, you know, Yale historian, no, his book is published by Yale. I'm not sure if he was um, uh, at Yale, but anyway, uh, um, he's a sort of, you know, major historian of the movement. And this is something that he took up doing. And this was his project in the 60s, you know, so it's been a long time um, coming. And I think it's very important. Uh, Anya, could you please translate the question for me? I can guess, but um... I, w I would like to answer, but I want to be sure that I have understood it. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 no, uh, как, um, uh, so thank you very much. Um, it's it's an interesting question because um, uh, there is um, 
there is a big um, uh, so there, there is a big difference between the places where uh, Mahno is being mentioned in this time. For example, the youth uh, Facebook pages uh, and uh, Facebook groups and other uh, social nets groups where the teenagers make memes with Mahno and they try to inspire themselves and to get some empowerment against the authoritarian Russian reality. So these memes are not uh, always uh, clever and intellectual, but uh, sometimes they are really stupid and have nothing to do with the real Mahnovshina, but they appear and it's very interesting. Uh, these teenagers find me sometimes and write me letters, like uh, they uh, gather in the kitchen and write me a letter and I try to answer them and to be, <laughs> uh, to be clear, but um, it's a strange phenomenon. It uh, appeared just, uh, I think, a year ago. Uh, but also there appear many, uh, uh, many books and texts of my colleagues. And uh, even uh, I have just published a text and I'm waiting for the publication in the next month about the epistemological uh, value of uh, phenomenon of Mahnovshina, where I try to find out uh, gender reflection and it's a very interesting case because I have read uh, many, many texts and um, testimonies of the people who knew Mahno and who were with him and uh, his own uh, diary and so on. And I make the textual analysis and try to analyze this with uh, those uh, scientific methods uh, which I have. So the epistemological value of Mahnovshina, it was a shock for the publisher and for some people who received my publication, but I hope it will appear. And uh, it's just the philosophical uh, view, but there are many historical views. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I think uh, every month uh, I see new publications of my colleagues from the historical sphere about Mahnovshina. So it's very, uh, it's very, important here, uh, especially in um, uh, especially uh, in the connection with the Ukrainian uh, war, as I have mentioned. So now we try to understand what it was and what was the colonial moment in that time, the times of Mahno, because we know that there were Moscow anarchists that also called uh, Ukraine as a, like a, um, south of Russia, uh, and uh, they didn't uh, accept the autonomy of uh, the Ukrainian place. And uh, 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 from the other side, we know that Mahno uh, didn't speak Ukrainian. He spoke Russian, but, but not the classical Russian. So it's the other question. He was something like between the two worlds. And uh, this, this thing is uh, researched. Uh, now is being researched by my colleagues. And it's a very interesting question. Thank you. And Katerina, you had a question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your talks. Um, my question is for both of you, I guess. Um, you both mentioned, mentioned that there is a restoration of the anarchist discourse, especially in the academic circles today in Russia. So I was wondering whether there is also a restoration of the anarchist discourse in uh, the Russian arts and literature. For example, um, is there something are there utopias? Is there a genre of utopias that uh, reminds, for example, uh, Karelian or Andreev in Russia today? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the questions. They're really so fantastic to think about. Um, uh, so uh, I don't think that Karelian has, you know, made it to the Russian stage or whatever yet, but, you know, maybe someday. But I do think that, uh, and Maria, you can fill in this picture more, I, I imagine, but I, I do think that there are some very interesting anarchist art projects. There is a whole sphere of things that I just don't know how to really interpret because I don't work on punk and music, but uh, like Russian punk is one of these spaces where um, uh, uh, anarchism is very interesting, historical uh, joins kind of with the historical legacy of, for example, anarchism in Siberia, uh, right, and then Siberian punk emerging and some of those um, influences coming together. I wish I was more articulate on this um, aspect. I just don't know it very well. In the sphere of uh, art, I have um, 
um, a couple of examples of uh, anarchist art I can think of. One of them is self-described as such, and um, the, this, this is a very interesting performance art group. Um, they're called Rodina, um, the motherland, um, and they, their projects and things have um, an avowedly, they are interested in developing an anarchist aesthetic. They call themselves um, anarcho echo necro femme, uh, right? So this is a feminist and also anarchist and also you know, ecological, but also um, sort of necro, necro critical, let's say necro critical of necro politics of the Putin regime sort of project. And they're totally fascinating. And, you can follow them on Facebook and see some of the um, projects that they've done. Um, and they are responding to past anarchist um, performance art practices. So for this, of course, it's very important to mention Vaina, um, Pussy Riot, um, individual performance like performers like um, Pavlensky, Piotr Pavlensky, all of these um, uh, uh, performance art, uh, performance artists are also very well versed in philosophy. They are um, uh, thinking about anarchism, if not kind of avowing uh, anarchism um, and studying incidentally was also very important to them. So, uh, you know, whereas for us, we might say, oh, this is purely academic, you know, uh, kind of um, um, hypothetical, whatever the for in testimonies, for example, by the Pussy Riot um, um, uh, artists, you can see that like studying was a very important part of cultivating an anarchist practice, you know. Um, and and so um, for them, they trace their art back to certain practices by uh, Moscow conceptualists, which um, at this point there have also been sort of um, uh, scholarly and I guess popular um, claims made on the Moscow conceptualists that they had kind of without really knowing or having connection to obviously in the you know in in the late Soviet period uh, anarchist philosophy were actually developing what are basically um, um, anarchist critiques of the Soviet um, um, of Soviet society like they they didn't know it but that is what they were doing their you know critique matches together and then some of this is what is very much what my book is about what i'm interested in is these genealogies where people are kind of having to reinvent the wheel um, multiple times because they have no um, access to uh, materials um, so um, I can give some more historical examples, and I think this is very interesting. But I'll also mention one more example that comes from probably something more well known to um, to folks here in this room, which is um, the work of Yelena Gremina in Teatro Doc. So Yelena Gremina didn't uh, in publicly announce herself as an anarchist. She did it in interviews privately, where. I was present, um, but uh, she actually in her interviews drops a lot of these terms like horizontal self-governance, like, you know, autonomous communities. She gives all of these kind of references and this helps to really, I think, think like explain um, her work um, in the documentary theater movement um, as different from the work of other um, uh, art, uh, documentary playwrights and artists who are part of that group. So this is part of a, she's part of this lively conversation about um, in this progressive and um, very um, po political theater, but she takes a sort of anarchist stance. First of all, you see this kind of long view of history, what the anarchists are um, interested in, saying that in state institutions are brittle, uh, but art communities will survive and they will re be reborn and they will in the end win the historic game because they're the ones who get to make the cool art. Um, and this is in her work about, you know, something like the Battle of, of Constantinople or the Mothers of Bislam. Like she's interested in um, kind of making the case that we may look like we're losing, but actually uh, we are winning and we are uniting and we are drawing new audiences like these Bislan activists together with the Moscow theater. Um, so I think that that's a very, you know, that's a very interesting element of Teatro Doc that all too uh, rarely gets talked about. In fact, no one I think uh, talks about it. Um, 
and it's very different from some of the other work that they do, like these kind of stage trials, for example, where they, you know, put on trial the um, uh, the the judge uh, in the case of um, um, uh, Mama Brodsky, right? So they imagine that they have this sort of like fantasy of liberal justice. If only the courts would work, then we would have, you know, a fair trial. But this is not something Grimena is interested in, right? And there are these kind of splieski, I guess, like Im like you know, kind of discourses emerging in other areas of um, of contemporary Russian art. That's very interesting. Thank you. We have three more questions lined up. Um, uh, so, Elenka, would you like to go next? Uh, I can. There was also a question from Jana, I think, in the chat. Did you count that? I did, yes. Okay, just, just don't want to jump in front of a queue. Um, first of all, thank you to both presenters. Sorry, I don't have my video, but I hope you can hear me well. Um, thank you very much for your work. It is very appreciated and followed just and especially to Maria because I know Russian academia can be brutal in terms of being overworked and underpaid and just I hope this will be just a reminder that you're doing very important work and it is appreciated around the world. Um, I have one question for both of you. Um, and another one just for Maria, and I can translate if needed. Um, so first question, like we started talking about like colonialism and anti-colonial um, issues and kind of my problem with the development of anarchism at the moment is that nationalism basically wins, right, as a project because of the current global citizenship regime, which like which is liberal capitalist and which privileges kind of certain citizenships on the market, right? And which then leads kind of leaves nationalism as kind of in a favorable position because nationalism can stage itself as being anti-colonial, right? On the one hand, but on another hand, it is very useful to because if you have an attachment to a nation, to a land, to a state, right, it is very useful for liberal capitalism than to market it. So my question is, how would anarchism then deal with it? If, if, if even in the earlier works, we can see what Anya mentioned that even anarchists do have a very strong connection to the idea of a land, right, of a certain national belonging. So. I, it's a it's a difficult question, but it's something that I think is quite important if we're talking about political projects. And another question is because we started talking about art is for Maria, and I know that you do a lot of art and and your photography. And I was wondering if you would tell more about your because you're quite a rare person in terms of your thinking about aesthetics politically, right? And you. You, you're quite good at theorize, theorizing your art as well. So I'm very interested in your idea of documentary palimpsest. And I wonder if you would talk a bit about that and about how you think your art in, in relation to aesthetics and politics. Thank you. I talked too long for the last question, so I will just say a couple of things. I think for thinking about land, the um, examples of the Rojava anarchists, these uh, Kurdish anarchists, not self-styled, but very close in practice and uh, kind of hearkening back to Kropotkin, to Murray Bookchin. Um, this is very interesting for contemporary anarchists. Um, and then the other example that they will often talk about is Zapatistas uh, in Mexico, right? So uh, for, for many anarchists, commitment to the label is secondary to um, this fascination with uh, you know, the fact that today uh, there aren't that many examples in the so-called Western world of like contemporary successful um, innovation in anarchism as lived in practice sort of life. But there is this fascinating um, um, ongoing struggle for what is amounts to, as far as anarchists can see, an anarchist form of life in Rojava in, in um, Chiapas, Mexico. And this is really in Rojava, Syria and in Chiapas, Mexico. And this is very interesting 
for anarchists and new ways of thinking about land um, and about sort of decolonial practice that maintains connection um, to land and to ethnic or cultural identity while still being inclusive. Um, I can add something. I'll try to. Uh, so thank you very much for your question and for your thoughts. Uh, so uh, what about the nationalist question? Uh, we know very many uh, successful projects like Machnovshina, for example. The most interesting thing in, in this project for me is that uh, even uh, during the very, uh, very um, uh, so um, to, I'll try to remember the word, <laughs> sorry, uh, very intensive uh, war actions, they succeeded in making uh, such peaceful projects uh, as um, pedagogy in the cities, in the towns where they uh, situated, where, where they stopped. So they, uh, they came into the uh, place, into the village, into the town, and they uh, gather the population there, even if they had for this just two days or three days or just a week, they uh, let the population um, do what they wanted to do with their uh, pedagogical uh, um, experiments. And uh, they succeeded in many things because they uh, invited uh, the teachers uh, that uh, which were which admired Francisco Ferrer and uh, such um, theoretics of pedagogy um, from the tradition uh, which uh, took um, uh, which uh, took uh, um, its beginning from the uh, Paris Commune like uh, Louisa Michel and so on so it was a very rich tradition that appeared even during the war actions in Machnovshina so it was not just a war project but a project uh, also peaceful despite the war. And there was no nationalist question for them. There were different nations. And as Anna uh, said, uh, the uh, principal anti-Semitic, uh, anti um, the, the, um, they were against anti-Semitism. And so uh, they, were, um, they were open for everyone. And uh, it, um, happened in many places like in Spain and uh, in other places like Sabatis and other uh, other regions. So we have such uh, a successful experience all over the world. Uh, it's hard to, uh, to um, count all these examples now, but we have uh, such examples. And uh, the, uh, what I think uh, about the nationalist question uh, According to um, uh, the situation in Ukraine now, uh, we hear uh, that uh, the Ukrainian uh, question is about nationalism, and uh, it's a popular. Uh, it's a popular way of uh, uh, making the question this way. Uh, so, as I know, the Ukrainians and how they understand this problem, uh, I know that for them. Uh, to be Ukrainian doesn't mean anything about the Ukrainian uh, nationalism, but that means that they don't want to be included in the uh, Russian uh, policy regime and that they don't want to be under control. They don't want to be um, in uh, danger like we are, like we here are, uh, policy danger and so on. So for them to be Ukrainian, that doesn't mean to be Ukrainian, that means to be not Russian, not Soviet. So it's like the apophatic uh, political position uh, where their religion is the Putin's uh, system and they don't want to be inside of it. And we don't too, but we don't have any choice, but they have <laughs> tried to make a regional defense. So uh, for them, it's not about the nationalism. There are nationalists there, but uh, in my street where I live now, uh, many walls, um, have uh, such uh, pictures in it with the swastics uh, and uh, like white power. It's everywhere here in St. Petersburg, in uh, Russia, in all the cities here. And it's a nation, Russian nationalism or Russian German nationalism. It's a paradox, but it is so. So not just Ukraine, but all the places in the world now have restoration of nationalism. 
and uh, it's um, principally incorrect to see it uh, to recognize it just in Ukraine, uh, at, uh, especially at the time when uh, Russian um, makes the intervention and makes uh, and demonstrates their military aggression. That's what about the nationalism. So not to be under the state, not to be under the control and the, the colonial control and the imperial control. Uh, when we stay inside of this project, uh, when we stay in this apathetic vision, then uh, we can be safe and we can be sure that we are uh, not uh, uh, we are not getting nationalist. I think so. So when it's not about the land in the sense of the land and blood and so on, Yes, like soil and blood in Reich, <laughs> but in the sense that the, uh, the project for us is open for everyone, but not for the state, not welcome for the policy. Uh, and uh, what about the art? <laughs> uh, so it's a little bit um, difficult to answer it because I was not ready for it, but I'll try to. So I, I'm a photographer for many years and I really try to put the philosophical understanding of a critic vision into the uh, artificial forms and uh, what you have uh, mentioned the uh, documentary palimpsest is the technique uh, that i use and that i have um, uh, cr created many years ago it's about uh, viewing uh, uh, the things from different sides because when we talk about power we talk uh, we always talk about seeing things from just one side and not understanding things from uh, themselves uh, as they are for themselves and as they are from the other sides. So um, when we make such a technique um, in art, when we can uh, problematize the one side seeing and where we can try to uh, make some other sides for watching the object, uh, it's like the making a horizontal project in social life where uh, everyone can um, uh, can show his vision uh, or her vision and uh, when we do such things even with the objects oh, not alive but uh, the still life objects or the la uh, landscapes or the animals or uh, even uh, with the people uh, so uh, it's uh, it's an attempt to walk with the uh, with the non acratic optics uh, non acratic analysis of the reality uh, so uh, I, uh, I use um, many reflections of the glasses when I make uh, photos, and uh, that's uh, that's my attempt to uh, to work with with the non acratic vision uh, with uh, in my um, photography. So uh, I I hope it was understandable a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I know that we're we're running later than we usually do for projects like this. So um, thank you for our speakers for keeping going and for all of you um, for being here. We do just have um, a couple of questions left. My question is really to go back to what you were talking about earlier. I know you are going to write about Phil Wilner, so forgive me if the question is something that you've already written about, but I'm really curious by the association you are making between Philonus and uh, uh, anarchism. And I'm really curious because in a sense, he's some, I mean, I can see to some, you know, I what I'm asking is, is it because he said he's an anarchist? I don't remember reading anything about that, but you know, probably he might have done, but he's a very curious kind of figure in the sense that he is almost sort of like renouncing some of his earlier work in his later work, yet he cannot completely renounce it. It's there present, ever present, even when he's making a sort of a proposal for what is effectively a, uh, an exhibition of socialist realist work. So somebody who, if he, is an anarchist. He was kind of. He was. He he had. He he may have been compelled by uh, circumstances. Obviously, I have no idea, or it may have been uh, an aesthetic conviction that made him change from his earlier work to his later work. So that was one question, and my other question was to Anya, which is about Galinian, which is the whole question of. You know, how did that guy survive? 
you know, in these extraordinary years, the fact that he dies in 1926 in his bed uh, is to me quite extraordinary, bearing in mind also how much he published. Uh, you know, it's not like he'd been quiet. So these are my two questions. Anya, could you please translate for me the question? I understand it, but... Я спросила про Филонова, потому что... Что, дело в том, что меня поражает, потому что он как бы работает, вначале он работает, я не знаю, если это можно назвать, я не знаю, если он, я не, не видела ничего, где бы он описывал себя как анархист, так что я не знаю, может быть, я не могу понять точно, где вот его отношения с анархизмом, тем более, что потому что потом к концу своей жизни он пытается, хотя не очень успешно, как бы перейти в другую систему мышления в своем искусстве. То есть у него есть, он подает картины ну, на, на соревнования по социализм, для социалистических выражений искусства. Поэтому это мой, был мой вопрос. Вот где mm -hmm. вот в нем вот этот анархизм? Filonov never said he was an anarchist, and uh, the main idea of this research was to find out if there was something acratic, so anarchistic, in his works. Why uh, did I put the question this way? Because um, uh, he was uh, outside of the official art, and uh, he was always ignored and uh, uh, so uh, marginalized by the Bolsheviks and Bolsheviks um, and their um, administrators from the academia. So for me, the question was why the artist who called himself communist was so marginalized. So it was a very interesting thing for me. And he was forgotten for the whole Soviet period. So no one remembered about him. He was prohibited. He didn't have exhibitions and so on. That's so I- That's entirely true. Not throughout the whole Soviet period. He was kind of rediscovered in the 70s, which is 70. why- so. I mean the the most of the Soviet yeah. period, but then there was the first exhibition in Novosibirsk. Yes, it was uh, it was late, really late. For the huge Soviet period, he was forgotten, and uh, many of his works were uh, stolen and and so on. So uh, the point for me was to understand to find out what had happened with uh, such a communist artist that didn't uh, that uh, that couldn't um, be incorporated in the Soviet system. And uh, to be uh, very, uh, uh, to be very, um, um, so shortly, uh, he uh, worked with a uh, method of, um, I don't know how to, how to use it in English, doneness. So when everything is done uh, and he made, them, he made uh, the name of his method, doneness. Uh, That's the principle of his uh, art was to uh, move from the point to the composition. It's like uh, um, an inductive art, but the academical art of the previous period, the uh, mainstream uh, was deductive, so we, we can uh, uh, we can <clears throat> think of it this way. So when we uh, move from the from something common to the point, and Filonov worked from the point. It was his main idea, and it's written in all his texts. What does it mean to move from the point to something common, where uh, both are uh, very important, uh, the point and the common? So for me, uh, it's um, an interesting. Uh, um, allusion to Stirner, who makes uh, who makes the main idea like the uh, one, so the point, and the community of the ones, so like points. So each point must be developed to its um, uh, to its um, mm, fullness. So uh, how to say it? To, to the end. So completion. Yes. To, uh, so to to its completion. Children in a sense yeah and all of them can be uh, gathered in one composition and it's the common but uh, when we uh, watch um, the paintings of Filonov we see uh, 
the composition made of points where each point is important so that we see this uh, complete, not um, like, um, uh, like uh, disappeared in the common, yeah? So, so these points don't disappear in common. That's uh, what he understood under the communism. He, uh, he talked often about the uh, world spring and the world communism and the flourishing of the world. And for him, all these points should, uh, they had to flourish. But in the Bolshevik project, uh, everything uh, was to get to the uh, complete composition without saving this uh, uh, completeness of each point. So each point uh, had to disappear inside of the common body of the um, nation of the Soviet project. So. I guess it's my, uh, uh, it's my, I don't know, um, suggestion. <laughs> um, no, how to say it. So uh, I guess that it, it was something about uh, anarchistic um, view inside of the communist tradition. And I try to, uh, to argument, uh, to argue this uh, point uh, in my text. Thank you. So how did Kalinin survive? Uh, Karelin, Karelin and Karelin, I mean. and um, another person I didn't mention, Alexei Baravoy, uh, all of these people uh, survived because they were um, touted as sort of model Soviet anarchists. Um, they were allowed to remain in powerful positions. They were wheeled out to sort of say, we support the revolution. Yes, we do. And then give a sort of um, slightly toothless uh, critique of the Soviet state within the kind of platform still remaining, you know, platform still remaining available to them, and then you know promptly wheeled back back in as they were uh, as, uh, to you know make sure that we the the um, Communist Party could still uh, massively execute the Kronstadt sailors or you know anarchists in the per per peripheries in the provinces um, organizing their stateless communes. So. Um, they actually, you know, enabled their presence or the discourse about them as Soviet anarchists enabled the covering up of um, this um, massive um, first sort of wave of um, party violence against their critics from the left, so to speak. And uh, even though the hour is late, um, we'll just keep you um, for uh, one last question. So um, Tadeusz has written um, in the chat. Uh, you can see his question here. He writes, um, the internet uh, promised to be a new, almost utopian space where different views on the past could peacefully coexist without state interference. And this um, idea, of course, was soon proved wrong. The internet is often just a new space for fighting old conflicts. Did the anarchist perspective on the internet develop along similar lines in the 90s um, and 2000s? I think so, yes. I mean, there, are, there are new projects um you know, always to sort of create anarchist spaces on the internet and there are server like servers and things like that that will let you host information for free or privately. And then there are, you know, various founders of various things like the Signal encrypted app or even supposedly the internet itself or anarchist avowed anarchists are participating in the creation of this and then it goes horribly awry. And so you have I don't know, like abusers being able to learn when their, um, you know, former victims are on signal because you, everybody gets the notification. You know, so there are many of su many such projects that um, uh, need constant improvement and innovation in order to um, uh, at least somehow resemble the hopes initially um, given to them. Okay, thank you all very much um, for your questions, participation. I think it's been um, a, a great session, a great discussion. And thanks, of course, in particular to our two speakers, to uh, Maria and to Anya. Um, it has been wonderful um, having you with us. I don't really know how we do applause or, you know, end these things on Zoom. Um, uh, yes, I can see some applause, Zoom kind of emojis things appearing. Um, Yes, there we go. We can fill the screen with those. Thank you very much indeed. It, is, it has been um, greatly appreciated.